So having discussed Freud and his psychosexual theories, I thought it would be good to contrast one other well-known developmental theorist, and that is uh, Eric Erickson. Okay, so Erickson has what he called a, a psychosocial theory of development. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to contrast that to Freud's uh, psychosexual uh, ideas and psychosexual stages of development. So uh, these ideas are based on Eric Erickson. This is uh, Erickson pictured when he was um, in his 80s. This is him when he was a young boy. And you may be wondering, as I did when I first learned about Erickson, why would anybody be named Eric Erickson? What a strange name. There's actually kind of an interesting story behind that that I'd like to tell you. So when he was born, he was not actually Eric Erickson. He was born Eric Salmonson. Salmonson was his name. Um, and uh, he actually was the result of an affair his mother had. So his mother was married to someone and uh, they were kind of estranged. They, they were separated and she was having a sexual relationship with another man and became pregnant with Eric. So Salmonson was Eric's, I guess, his mother's husband's last name. But he really didn't know that he was Eric Salmonson growing up. Uh, when he was growing up, he knew his name to be Eric Homburger. So another name introduced to the mix here. Homburger was actually his uh, stepfather. So when he was very young, really before he was able to form memories, apparently, um, young Eric was adopted. So his mother remarried um, and he was adopted by his stepfather and given the name Homburger. So he just grew up knowing that his name was Eric Homburger. Um, he only found out about all of this, you know, the kind of origins of his birth and all these different names um, when he was older. Um, and he never apparently could never quite get a straight answer out of his mother about who his birth father really was. She did tell them, tell him that uh, his birth father's name, first name was Eric. And that's why she named him Eric. So really, he named himself as an adult, Eric Erickson. Um, so he gave himself that that last name, Erickson. And I tell you this story because it's kind of important to Erickson's theory because um, identity became an important theme throughout his life. So figuring out who you are, knowing who you are. He felt for a long time growing up that he didn't know who he was. And um, he didn't really look like his peers. So... You, I don't know if you can tell from, from this picture, but um, at least when he was younger, he was kind of a Nordic looking person. So tall and blonde. His, his mother was a short, dark, uh, kind of complected woman, as was his uh, stepfather, Mr. Homburger. So he really stood out. And he grew up in a Jewish household um, and went to Jewish schools and it really didn't fit in there either. It didn't look like his peers. And so, as I said, identity became a really important theme throughout his life. Um, so, yeah, he was he was teased for being Jewish when he was a kid um, by some kids. And then the Jewish kids um, teased him because he didn't look like the other Jewish kids. So he really got it from all sides. Um so if we just uh, for a minute compare Erickson's ideas to Freud's, which we discussed, um, one thing you should know is that Erickson considered himself a Freudian. So he thought, I mean, he, he never worked directly with Sigmund Freud, but he really kind of followed in the footsteps of Freud in some ways. And he actually did work with Anna Freud, who was Freud's, uh, Sigmund Freud's daughter. The difference between Erickson and Freud is that Erickson is going to stress the social aspects of development um, and, and much less focus on sexuality, especially compared to Freud. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, Erickson's going to talk about psychosocial stages of development, um, and that's in contrast to Freud's psychosexual stages of development. Okay, so let's talk about these psychosocial stages of development that Erickson came up with. Um, Erickson thought that these were a series of stages that we go through from birth into death. And each one of them is going to involve what he called a social challenge. So it's like society sets up a challenge for us at each um, 
each of these stages and some kind of obstacle that we have to overcome, okay, in our social development. Um, the first psychosocial stage that Erickson talked about was what he called trust versus mistrust. So as we're going to see each stage that Erickson talks about, it's always something versus something. Okay. So the trust versus mistrust stage goes from birth to one year of age. And remember, these are, these psychosocial stages are um, involving social development. So who, who is in our social world when we're uh, in the first year of our life? Well, primarily it's our parents. So Erickson says, um, the relationship that we have with our parents and the kind of care that they give us in, in our first year is going to determine whether we develop a sense of trust or a sense of mistrust. And he thinks that these, you know, how this goes is going to kind of set the stage for the rest of our lives. So if you think for a second and ask yourself, um, do I think I'm a, a generally a trusting person? Or am I uh, more of a mistrusting person? Am I someone who kind of mistrusts people? Erickson would say you could trace that back to your first year of life. Even though you can't remember that, the social development you had with your parents um, set the stage for whether you become a trusting or a mistrusting person. So to develop trust, which is obviously a more um, positive outcome, Erickson says that the, the social interaction between the parent and the child is such that the, the, the kid is given physical and emotional comfort when they need it. And they have learned that they can depend on the caregiver. In other words, they have learned that, that when, when I need something, I can trust that my caregiver is going to provide it. So I'm, I'm hungry. I can, I don't have to worry about, um, I don't have to worry about that too much. I can trust that, that my caregiver, my parent is going to feed me when I need my diaper change that is taken care of too. Um, on the other hand, if you grow up in a, in a household where your care is unreliable, uh, and you learn early in life that, um, that you can't trust that, that these things are going to be, uh, your needs are going to be met, you're going to develop a sense of mistrust. So if sometimes you get fed and sometimes you don't, uh, if sometimes you cry because you're, you need some attention and you, and you get it. And other times you cry and cry and cry and nothing happens. Uh, you don't get any, any attention. Erickson would say you're going to develop a sense of mistrust. And once again, uh, he thinks this is going to set the stage for uh, a lot of the rest of our lives. What happens to us in the first year of life, which is kind of interesting to think about. We move on from there, though, to the next psychosocial stage of development, which Erickson called autonomy versus shame or doubt. So this is the first, uh, it goes from uh the first year of life into the third year of life. So age one to three. Okay. Um, and again, we see it's, it's something versus something autonomy. Uh, if that's not, if that word is not in your vocabulary, that basically means independence. And so Erickson says the social challenge here is children begin to try asserting their independence. Uh, you've all probably heard of the terrible twos. Uh, one thing that makes the terrible twos, the terrible twos is, um, many kids at that age, uh, say no, they're, they're resistant. Um, many kids, uh, say, no, I, I want to do that myself. No, no, let me do it. And so Erickson would say, this is kind of a natural thing. And if you are allowed to explore the world, if your parents encourage that, you're going to develop a sense of autonomy or independence. In other words, you know, when you start um, getting into things, you get maybe get into the kitchen cabinets, your parents don't immediately say no and don't punish you for it. Um, they maybe let you explore a little bit, you know, assuming you're not getting into trouble or danger. Um, Erickson says that's actually a good thing. So you're developing as a parent, you're developing a sense of, of autonomy or independence in your child. However, if, um, as a parent, every time your child tries to explore, they're punished and they're punished, uh, severely and harshly. Erickson says that's going to develop, um, a, a lifelong sense of shame or doubt, sort of, uh, this idea that, oh, I, I can't do that. Oh, I shouldn't try. Oh, I shouldn't explore the world. So, you know, if, if you're a, a little kid and you start opening, um, a cabinet in the kitchen again, let's say, 
And immediately your parent slaps your hand, yells at you and tells you, no, 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 no. And that happens every time you try to um, get into something new. Erickson would say uh, as a parent that the parent is developing a sense of shame and doubt. I mean, obviously you don't want the, the, the kid to be in danger or to hurt themselves, but Erickson would say it's good to encourage at least a little bit um, this sense of exploration. All right, well, if we move on to the next psychosocial stage of development, Erickson calls this one initiative versus guilt. So this is age three to five years, so roughly preschool age. And what's going on here socially, uh, according to Erickson, or one of the most important things that's happening is uh, kids begin to plan and carry out their own ideas and actions. Um, so kids, uh, his minds have developed to the point where they can sort of make plans about things. They sort of think through things. Sometimes their ideas are not very practical. Um, but you know, they, they want to, um, they want to do things their own way. Okay. So uh, just a quick story to help you kind of understand this. Maybe, um, I have a distinct memory of when I was this age or the tail end of this. So I was five years old and I was in kindergarten. Um, and, uh, I was not allowed to pick out my own clothes, um, for school. And, and I had this favorite, um, pair of pants and now this was a long time ago, but these pants were striped. So they had, um, uh, stripes going up and down the legs. Um, and if I remember correctly, the stripes were brown and maybe orange and blue in retrospect, they were probably pretty ugly, but, um, those are my favorite pants. And then I had a, a favorite shirt, um, that did not match the pants at all. The shirt was kind of, uh, I don't even know where this came from, but um, it was kind of a silky sort of a thing and it had blue and maybe black sort of design on it. But, um, I tell you all that because, uh, my goal for a long time was to, uh, allow, get my mom to allow me to wear my favorite pants with my favorite shirt to school. As I mentioned, they didn't match at all. Okay. Um, and, and she said, no, that, that doesn't match. You, 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 you can't wear that. Um, and I would ask and I would ask, and I remember one day, she, I guess I must've worn her down because she finally said, okay, yeah, you go ahead and wear your, go ahead and wear your pants with your shirt. They didn't match. I remember the reactions I got at school that day, not from the other kids, but my, um, I, I remember my teacher asked me if my mom was sick and I didn't really understand what that meant. I, I have a better idea of what it means now, but, uh, the adults, I, I got a feeling from the adults that maybe, uh, I, I came to understand that maybe I was not dressed uh, appropriately. So after that, I kind of let my mom pick out my own clothes for a while. But that whole story I tell you um, is, and I, I tell you that story because uh, Erickson would say that my mother actually did a good thing the day that she let me wear that stuff to school because she allowed me to take some initiative. So um, I was allowed uh, to, uh, I was allowed the freedom to make my own mistakes and take the responsibility for my behavior. Erickson would say, you know, when kids are this age, um, you may see them, let's say they're, they're trying to construct something out of Legos and you can just tell that it's not going to work. It's just it, <laughs> structurally, it's not going to, it's not going to support itself. Erickson would say, instead of correcting them immediately, let them make the mistake on their own because sometimes we learn more from mistakes than we do from successes. So if that's the kind of attitude you grow up in, you're going to develop a sense of initiative, which is a good thing. Hopefully you've noticed by this point, everything on the left of the verses is the positive outcome. Um, everything on the right is the negative outcome. Um, so if you're a parent who doesn't allow your kid any freedom to make these kinds of choices, then, um, you know, your, your child is going to develop a sense of guilt, um, and guilt in the sense that every time they try to take any initiative, they're going to feel guilty about that. Like I shouldn't be doing this. Okay. It's, it's a mistake. I, I'm going to mess up like I always do. All right. Um, but let's move on to, next to the, uh, uh, next psychosocial stage. This one is called, uh, industry versus inferiority. So this is six to 10. This would be the elementary school age. Um, and the social challenge here involves school and schoolwork. Okay. So think about somewhere in elementary school, something that you, uh, were learning or your teacher was trying to teach you that you remember being especially challenging. 
it could be for a lot of kids, it's, it's something like long division or it could be fractions or, you know, something like that, but something you just struggled with. Okay. Um, every kid has experiences like that. Um, but for the most part, if, you know, your teacher is trying to teach you things. And even if you struggle with it, you're eventually able to understand it and, and do it and accomplish it. You develop a sense of industry. So if you learn how to do long division and the remainders and all of that, or you learn how to do cursive writing, um, and you're kind of keeping pace with the other kids in your class, Erickson would say you developed a sense of industry. Industry meaning I'm feeling industrious. I'm feeling like I, I can do stuff. I can do things on my own. I can accomplish things. On the other hand, if consistently when your teacher throws new things at you, so today we're going to learn fractions or whatever it is. And, and it seems like every time you're the last kid in the class to get it, or sometimes you don't even seem to get it. Erickson would say you're going to develop a sense of inferiority, feeling not as good as the other kids. And like with the other stages, Erickson would say, this is something that could continue this, this kind of feeling of inferiority could continue um, even later into your life. Okay. So the last stage I'm going to talk about here is called uh, by Erickson identity versus role confusion or role diffusion. So this is 10 to 20. So that's kind of a broad age range, but basically just think about kind of uh, when puberty starts on into early adulthood. Okay. Um, another way of saying that is adolescence. So Erickson said the big social challenge here is uh, trying to figure out who we are. So think back to the story I told you at the beginning about Erickson and his names and trying to figure out who he was. Um, this is a central piece of his theory, according to Erickson. So, you know, and it's, identity is something that that many of us struggle with when we're adolescents feeling or trying to figure out where we fit in, which 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 click or which crowd or which group we fit in with uh, at school. Are we with the jocks? Are we with the preppy kids? Are we with the band kids, the drama kids? Like, where do we fit in? Right. And so if you come out on the other end of this, so like on into college age and you feel like I know who I am, I know what I believe. Um, I know the kind of people I like and people I don't like. I maybe have a sense of even what I want to do for a living. Erickson would say that you developed a strong sense of identity. Um, on the other hand, if you struggle with that, so you float from thing to thing or um, you change your major uh, four or five times in college, or maybe you drop out of college and then restart college or um, go to trace, you know, you just kind of, you have a hard time figuring out what you want to do and who you are. Erickson would say, unfortunately, you have a sense of role confusion. Okay. So until you um, are able to figure out your identity, you're going to struggle with uh, knowing who you are. Now, um, I just want to make a note. There are actually three more uh, adult stages of um, Erickson's theory where this is not a class in adult development, but if you're interested, um, there's a class called psychological development in adulthood, and, uh, you can, we'll certainly talk about those stages in, in that class. Just to end here, I want to show you an embarrassing photo of me. This, I, I might've in, uh, included a picture or something like this on the syllabus too, but this is me when I was in kindergarten. Okay. And this is the shirt I was referring to. So, uh, that's the shirt I wanted to wear. Now, apparently my mom dressed me this day because the, the, my clothes sort of match. But if you can imagine this outfit with some striped pants of different colors, it just was a mistake. Okay. Um, but Erickson would say that my mom did a good thing and uh, instigated um, a strong sense of initiative in me. So that's all I have for this video. I hope this helps you understand Erickson's stages uh, as we walk through them, particularly as they apply to childhood.